Mark and I'm CEO of the Silverstone Technology Cluster. Um, welcome today at um, a special interest group meeting. Um, let me get rid of that on the screen. Um, so this is a special interest group meeting from the wearable technology special interest group. Um, we, um, as the STC, we're a not-for-profit cluster support organization. So we exist to support the roughly four and a half thousand um, advanced engineering, electronics and software businesses in the wider Silverstone area, uh, which is roughly anywhere within an hour's driving time. Uh, so we do that through promotion, support and thought leadership, as you can see on the banners um, behind me and in the room. Uh, so promotion is both the cluster as a whole, because um, in a report that we did back in 2016, um, everybody indicated that this is the best place in the world for advanced engineering, uh, which may sound like an incredibly boastful pl um, claim, but when they were asked if there was anywhere else in the world they wanted to move to, they said no. Um, and then also, if you realize that of the 10 Formula One teams, eight have bases in this area, you start to feel that that's not a coincidence. Um, so, um, so that's the message that we want to put out. We've had about six different delegations in from China, two different delegations in from France. Uh, and from India as well. But we've also attracted the attention of the likes of BA Systems, UK government, and Heathrow, who we've all helped find um, innovative technologies um, as supplied by some of our SME members. Um, there's also internal promotion, though, because uh, our cluster is not a motorsport cluster. It's actually uniquely uh, multi-sectorial. Um, and it's because a lot of the companies started off as motorsport businesses, but have since diversified into all sorts of different uh, markets. And we've also seen a lot of people that used to work at motorsport companies um, set up their own business in the area, um, but not in motorsport. And in fact, often uh, spinning out some of the technologies that they developed for the motorsport company into, into different areas. And so it's very much multi-sectorial and covers pretty much any sector you can, you can think of. Um, so that brings us to uh, the thought leadership piece as well. Um, because we're so multi-sectorial, we have a number of different special interest groups around different technologies to bring like-sided um, people together. So we're at one of those meetings here today. Um, so today is all about wearable technology. So anything that you would have in and around your person, but data management as well. Other groups that we have uh, involve uh, future mobility. So anything to do with future transport or so electrification, but also infrastructure, ride sharing platforms and all that sort of stuff. Uh, digital and advanced manufacturing, so industry 4.0, additive manufacturing, things like that. And then another group on design, simulation, and meteorology, um, which is most easily summarized as complicated stuff um, that do like digital twinning and quantum sensing and um, all sorts of other things that I, I just don't understand. Um, but it's very much members driven. So they come to us with what we should have the groups about. And then they we form a little subgroup of their, of them if uh, if there's enough appetite and then they set the set the, the theme and the subject for the for the events that that we then we then host um and then obviously there's a support strand as, uh, as well which is all around business growth so we we help them with their business growth as well so um we have partnership with the british business bank to help people with finance we have partnership with be the business to help them with strategy and uh, business development and obviously we do a lot of business uh, growth events and a lot of webinars and podcasts and all that sort of helpful stuff so we're we're here very much to support them um with all their various needs um so kicking off into into today, um, he says optimistically if it's working. <laughs> um, so with all of these events, your feedback is is very important for us. So if you would all wouldn't mind scanning the QR code, we'll we'll bring it back up again later on as well. But scan the QR code. I mean, by all means, by all means, tell us how brilliant we are right now, or you could wait until after the event and then tell us what you thought of the event. Um, but if you wouldn't mind doing that, it's, it's a quick way um, for us to, to get your feedback and, and to get um, to yeah to get your ideas and uh, and also help us approve these events for the future. So um, we'll come back to that later on, I'm sure. So um, in terms of what we're doing today, so um, I'm obviously rambling through my introduction now. Uh, Silverstone Park, we're going to do an introduction as well, but Ruth was meant to be here today, but unfortunately she's ill. Um, so we don't only have the weather and the traffic to contend with, but lots of illnesses as well. Um, so I am also going to try and ramble through that bit. Um, so please bear with me uh, while we do that, because I know a bit about the park, but I'm by no means an expert, but we'll, we'll give it a good go. Uh, luckily, they've given me a video to run as well. So we'll, we'll press play on that and see what happens, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, we'll then go into some of the some of the presentations. So we've got Christopher here from Incas, and then obviously uh, we've got Professor Oliver Pierce and Professor uh, Blaine Price um, to, to talk to us as well. Um, and then even though Aryan isn't here yet, we're very hopeful that he will arrive 
um, to talk to us from DDM Health. Uh, we then have a little break so we can refill our teas and coffees and things. And then we're, we're getting an online presentation from uh, Harry Kimberly Bowen on Spaceband. Um, and then we'll have uh, a bit of a panel discussion. Um, and we'd always like to make these interactive. So please, you know, don't don't be shy and, and get involved. Um, and then after all that, we'll, we'll give you some lunch. I mean, clearly, you're going to be earning your lunch during a panel discussion. So anybody who's not active, I, I, I won't allow to be fed. So just so you're four ones in advance. Um, now, in terms of uh, the, the introduction to Silverstone um, Technology Cluster, I mean, I've, I've kind of done that. I mean, obviously, you know, we are here to help. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization. So if you feel there's anything that we can be of assistance with, you know, always feel free to, to contact me or anybody in the team. Um, you know, we're, we're here to assist and we'd love to hear from you. So, so please do that. Um, now, in terms of Silverstone Park, um, so we'll play the video in a bit. Um, but I just wanted to, to briefly tell you a little bit about Silverstone Park. So uh, Silverstone Park is, is really the business park that surrounds the, the racetrack. So the racetrack is a separate entity, um, but you're obviously here in the business park today. Uh, so we're here today in the, in the Innovation Center where there's, there's some, uh, some spaces available, not that many, I, I believe, um, because MEPC, ever since they came in in 2013, have done an absolutely amazing job. Um, in, in basically filling it up and, and renting it all out. So, uh, because most of the stuff that you can see out there today didn't exist in 2013 and they've, they've been building a lot. Um, in total, I believe they've got 2 million square feet of space to expand into. Um, so what they've done now or what you can see here is, is really just the beginning. Um, but they, they um, somehow operate with a model because I think they're now into phase four. Uh, which they haven't started building yet. And I believe that 75% of that is already let out. Um, so the, the demand is absolutely huge and, and they throw up bespoke buildings and, um, and all sorts of um, things as well. But actually the most interesting thing about MEPC, who are the, the ultimate um, owners of Silverstone Park, is, you know, of course they're about building buildings and renting them out. But actually, interestingly, they are very, very good and focus very much on building a community. Um, so not only were they the driving force behind the Silverstone Technology Cluster and one of our founding members um, to obviously create a, a wider community, uh, but also on the park itself, they work a lot to make um, to make it a, a community feel and to um, to bring businesses together. So there's there's things like summer barbecues and they do pizza lunches and there's football and there's Pilates classes and all you know, outdoor gyms, obviously not today, um, but all sorts of stuff um, going on to really create that community feel, make this a very pleasant place for people to work that they want to go to. I think in some of the new buildings that they're proposing, there's also going to be like a gym and like a, a child mining facility and all that sort of stuff. Um, so they're really pushing forward with this with this community feel and, and making sure that they do a lot of stuff. Um, you know, they do quizzes as well and all that sort of stuff. Um, to really make sure that, that you know, the, the environment is a pleasant one for people to be like. So not just posh buildings, but also, you know, actually really good community feel um, to bring people together. And they're, and they're very, very good at doing that. Um, and I think that that differentiates them from people who just throw up a bunch of fancy buildings and, and that's that. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, quite an important distinction, I think. Um, but now we're going to try and see if we can get this video to run. So that gives you a brief flavor of, of Silverstone Park. Um, but um, I mean, obviously we have a, a fantastic relationship with them, with, with them being one of our founding members. So if there's any questions, by all means, fire that into us and then we'll make sure that um, that we can get them answered. Um, as I said, Ruth was meant to be here today, but sadly she's, she's ill. Um, but yeah, um, 
it's uh, it's it's a pretty amazing place, and um, I'm I'm sure that if you come back here in another five year, years, it will be uh, more than double what it is now, um, which is which is really quite amazing. Um, but there we go. We'll uh, we'll leave that there because um, after all, I only know so much. Um, let's see if we can let that person in. Um, um, right, so we'll kick on with the rest of the day, um, and therefore I will now hand over to Christopher from Incas. Over to you. Great, thanks everyone. And uh, welcome to uh, everyone who's online as well. Thank you for having me here. My name is Chris, and I'm Managing Director at Incas Performance. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what we do at Incus uh, a little later, but uh, my background, just to give some references, um, almost 10 years now in sports technology and uh, sports innovation, typically in the sports of swimming, running and cycling. Uh, so I started off designing bicycle frames, which I've just noticed actually one of the, the lights of which uh, are on that uh, little banner over there um, for Team GB and for British Cycling, uh, as well as some pro teams as well back in 2013-14 so the kind of Tour de France stage wins and stuff like that um, Olympic records were set on bikes that I designed in Nottingham with some help for people who are actually based here on this um, Rob Lewis yes oh, exactly yes, Rob, yes. yes. so uh, him and his team um, we go back so um, yeah it's great to be talking today about what I'm working on now and have been for the last six years at Inca's performance um, where we are a wearable technology and innovation company, um, effectively helping people to improve swimming, running and cycling through advanced data analytics rather than through the equipment technologies I used to develop um, back in the day. Um, so ultimately we're here to help people to push boundaries. We are a, an independent British innovation company um, that are helping people um, to collect the right data in their sports but also to understand and apply that. Um, and so we developed a full stack technology approach, which is what we mean is that we've, we have a, a device that measures how your body moves. And we've developed all of the, an, the anla, na, uh, analytics, excuse me, um, the, the data infrastructures and uh, all of the front end as well to give a cohesive and full experience. So the way that we see is that the future of sport is very much connected. Um, there's been a huge growth um, in particularly multi-sports since um, COVID started and literally millions of people across the world that swim, run and bike regularly. Um, does anyone do any of these sports? Hands up. Awesome. Okay, great. So we're in the right place. Um, so through COVID, these activities, we've seen like loads of people, um, particularly in running, threefold increase in running. Um, but there's... So there's very much at the same time a huge amount of investment in online digital products. So very much like motorsport, um, people here naturally have seen the way that data has been able to completely revolutionise the way that the broadcast has in, uh, told stories about motorsport, um, motorsport and got people involved into the action. There's very much uh, an investment in individual sports now, swimming, running and cycling. Um, to take that same arc of using data to tell a great story and involve people um, through broadcast. And we're seeing the lights of the Olympic Games as well, starting to include virtual sports in um, their future games. And so that kind of, um, together with COVID and with climate change reasons, we can't, we need to start to rethink global competition and a way of getting lots and lots of athletes in a single location all the way across the world is becoming more and more challenging. Um, and so we see a future very much where um, we can start to solve these problems through advanced data and storytelling. <laughs> the problem with this, though, is that no one has been able to really successfully connect the, the real world um, and individual sports with the digital world. So if you're a cyclist, you'll be very good at sitting on your indoor train and you enjoy virtual worlds like your Zwifts or your trainer roads and such. But taking that outside and you're pretty much tethered to your Wi-Fi router. Um, and so having those same experiences outside is, is always very, very tricky. Um, the challenge is, is because most of these technologies are, are based for fitness and well-being um, technologies, uh, which are not necessarily for live stream data and getting that data out of these environments to, uh, to connect these virtual worlds. Um, 
you don't necessarily have any products that have been built from a hardware perspective to interlink all of these technologies that are coming out from blood glucose sensors, heart rate monitors, cycling power meters. They all do a great job by helping to tell a story. You need to bring them together and actually get them out to people in real time. And finally, really, um, data for data's sake is, is meaningless. I mean, there's, there's a lot of data being collected about performance in, in um, the world. Um, but if you can't understand that and apply it at the right time, um, then you can't affect that behavioural change, which is what we're all trying to do. Um, and so we see a significant gap there in providing actionable feedback, particularly in injury and efficiency. And that's really what we focus on at Incus Performance. So for the first time, we are enabling live stream technologies from the environments of swimming, running and cycling without supporting infrastructure at all. So most GPS technologies or some of these kind of, um, you know, locations in your team based sports or most sports, you've got a big car and a big battery and, you know, lots of places signals off to know where people are and how fast they're going to be able to tell that story. If you're doing a, an Ironman triathlon, you don't want to be carrying a huge battery on your back um, to be able to have the power to, to get that data out. Um, and so beginning in the world of multi-sport, really, um, we are partnering with um, major events to provide live stream services for data that includes your location, um, but aspects of your technique, your performance and injury risk as well in real time for, to improve the broad category. Um, we provide this um, also to connect to additional peripheral sensors. So your heart rate monitor, maybe a chest belt that does a great job for heart rate monitoring or cycling power, but isn't built to get that out to tell a story for live stream. We also bring that data to one place um, through a device uh, that we have. It's super simple to deploy. Um, so a big part of telling the story is about um, making it easy for people to understand and also easy for to collect uh, data in the ground. So we simply rock up with a laptop and a variety of devices that we have that people wear. And um, within 10 minutes, we have a live stream that can go anywhere in the world. So simply we turn something like this, which is a broadcast product um, for multi-sport. Um, has anyone watched a triathlon before? And yeah, seen the Commonwealth Games? Who, who's who in, this, in the swim, right? It's the big thing. Thing. Um, a lot of it is um, important for telling that story. Who knows who's even in front? And a lot of the time, there's misclassification in terms of knowing who it is, and they think that the wrong person is actually in front. Um, but actually, more importantly, for mass events, safety is a huge aspect in this. You've got a mass of swimmers there, and most people don't don't know for sure that somebody's had an issue until they haven't got out of the water. Um, and also in terms of triathlon, uh, particularly, you know, they're not quite up at the level of the Tour de France yet, but even those sports can improve. How fast are people going? How close are the lead pack and the chase pack? How can we create this excitement to tell a great story, improve the whole, um, the whole experience of people watching these kind of events online? Ultimately, what we're trying to do is improve that engagement to get to the well-being aspect of encouraging people to do more swimming, running and cycling in the future. And that's what we get to. So we turn something like this into something that's a lot more interactive through a product that we call mixed reality. So mixed reality to us is the blending of live, real, outdoor sport with the virtual world, with the connectivity and interactivity of the virtual world at exactly the same time. Um, so it goes much more than just location to the broadcast. We provide on the fly information like your stroke rate, distances, um, how far, how predicted times and aspects of this to, to improve that, that are all available through your mobile devices as well that you can follow in the race. So instead of having to stick with what the broadcast is saying um, at the front of the race, you know, you just get to see what the TV cameras want to show you. Instead, you can actually go and interact with that event yourself, zoom in on who you want to follow. And with a big event like that, um, particularly mass participation, um that's really important and so if you are um waiting for somebody at the london marathon for example who's ever looked at the the timing chips to see well it should be coming across but i can't quite see in all of these many people we can now give to the second information that tells exactly where people are but also improve that experience for everyone uh, we recently did this actually out at the um abu dhabi World Triathlon Series Grand Final, um, where we went out there to uh, deliver live stream products here, which 
should be a video and interactive aspect to show exactly what we do, but um, I've uh, I've left that out of this particular one. But if anyone wants to see it, then please do column me afterwards. Mm -hmm. But we're providing rich map information here, fully interactive, that you can actually physically put yourself into the map, and it's you're looking through the the cam uh, your phone like a like a lens effectively, and um, you're able to jump yourself between the different parts of the course and feel like you're there even if you're in a different continent. So we were live streaming this to um, people all across the world, and they were seeing from every three seconds from the event actually happening it was being viewed somewhere like thousands of miles away. Um, so that's kind of the start of what we're doing. So how does it all work? Um, I'll get onto this device that I have flashing in my hands. This is the Incus Nova. It's a device that we've developed in-house at Incus Performance that measures to a really high quality how your body moves. It also measures where you are in space so that we can get precisely where you are, but how you're getting from A to B. We have advanced analytics on there that recognize your swimming, running and cycling activities as well um, to automatically detect areas of efficiency and injury risk um, through software. We connect and, um, and drive these kind of peripheral sensors like heart rate, but we send that directly to a cloud. Um, so what that means is that you don't have to have any setup. It goes straight from this device through a mobile network to our servers that we can either send to a TV screen to make that more exciting or to have directly interacted on your mobile device. Um, so we've really developed everything from the ground up uh, with a small team based in Loughborough um, and we continue to validate scientifically all of our measurements to um, publishing these in journal papers and such to add to the overall um, research um, value of, uh, of what we're doing for the space. Um, you can also buy this product, um, which is um, a device that we want to make this technology accessible to everyday people. So instead of just having it in the race environment um, and for, at the moment, professionals to improve the commentary and broadcast experience, um, we simply have a, a way of, you know, you take the same device and you can compare yourself with the professionals you're seeing on TV. And that's is where we're coming to this level of inspiration for new audiences, for everyday people to encourage them and inspire them from what they're seeing on TV um, and to help them to improve their way of uh, accessing data. Um, so you simply put it on, you forget about it and everything is done through software, it's done automatically. So recognize exactly when you're swimming, running, cycling, give you exact body angles, left, right, um, power when you're running or when you're cycling, uh, when you're swimming, sorry. It will give you how much you're landing on left and right hand sides as you are running which is a very much um, indication of injury as well. And we are validating that in through scientific studies. So we can literally predict running injuries before you feel them by the way that your body moves due to the quality of how we're measuring motion and the quality of our software analytics that understands that from the whole body. Um, and then we share research-based um, results and, um, and content from people to say how to improve that. So that's the action aspect of it to say, you know, we detect that you have an imbalance here whilst you're running. Here's some content to improve that so you actually can, you know, get that. So in simple terms, we take the squiggly lines, the likes of your training peaks and your Stravas and your garments, who ever's heard of that. Um, they show data in its basically raw form where it's lots of squiggly lines and who knows what to do with that, right? It's not very human. We're bringing this into a much more human experience where we're saying what aspects are good in that, how that relates to your injury risk, and where you can improve with content to help you to improve that. And we already integrate with Strava, with Apple Watch, Garmin, and other aspects there. Um, so the shameless plug is we know what we're doing. Uh, we've, we have a variety of wins from, uh, from in terms of innovation, but we're most proud to be working with some of the, uh, the athletes uh, who are the finest in, in the field, likes of Alistair Brownlee, who's invested in us, um, who we're working with uh, for this race product as well uh, in the background. So a bit about our process, um, we take a unique full stack approach to, uh, to technology, um, providing an end-to-end -end delivery where we have a device that measures really high quality motion and um, an orientation uh, and then streams that all the way through to the analytics that recognize those motions and then the apps to improve that. 
Um, we do a lot of infield testing and user labs and engagement, um, and we actually genuinely validate this scientifically uh, at Loughborough. So some examples of that, this is one of our setups um, with one of our amateur athletes who has a double camera setup. We're actually in real time using um, video um, software and analysis to know um, exactly how the person's moving in real life and how our devices can measure against that kind of ground truth. Um, we do the same thing in swimming as well with high, high speed cameras um, based at Loughborough, uh, where we are based and where the development of the technology has been from, from ground up. Uh, that's some of our team, yeah. <laughs> so getting onto the topic of well-being um, and how wearable technologies can improve well-being and our ideas of where the future of that goes. We believe well-being is um, simply encouraging people to do something a little bit different, a little bit better yeah. each day. That's our ethos at Incus. Despite the fact that we're working with multiple Commonwealth and world champions, we want to inspire everyday people to just do something a little bit different. A little bit better. So our ideas of where the future of well-being and how the role of which wearable technology has in this is um, it needs very much to make data um, accessible and to be easy to use. So um, to get mass participation and mass people um, using a technology it needs to be seamless and that's why we've taken that full stack approach that kind of complete technology end-to-end -end approach because you simply press one button and it doesn't have to do anything else. Um, we think that really the action um, and the actionable information is the future of where we're going. It has to be relevant, has to be useful to people, has to be contextualized to say, well, why does heart rate matter for you in this particular, you know, um, if you're just doing the couch to 5K, why is it you care about doing heart rate? And so the context um, of which you can provide that information is so important to improving the, um, the person at whatever level that they're going. But we believe that ultimately uh, the future of wearable technology should be about storytelling. And that is very much about that technology aspect combined with the context in which we're doing. Um, we really believe that the future of it is it's about providing experiences that connect people. And so um, it's to inspire and encourage people to get active, to do more fitness and to uh, keep better health and wellness for themselves we believe that that's very much about connecting people and that's the reason why we developed a technology that allows people to be connected across the world um, at exactly the same time through the sports of swimming running and cycling um, and the future of where we're taking this is that i could literally walk out of my door in nottingham and go for a run and share the same experience with a friend in nice at exactly the same time, connected through this real-time technology and through our smartwatches, be able to actually see and enjoy a, uh, a, a mixed reality experience that um, brings people together um, whilst doing that outside. So, uh, yeah, um, we haven't talked much about the rehabilitation side of what we're doing, but uh, there's plenty of medical people here today that will talk about uh, that in terms of well-being. So, um, Thank you for listening, and um, that's a little bit about what we've done, I think, as performance. So, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, fascinating. Please come round this way. I'm more yeah, yeah, with the yeah. uh, yeah. table over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, fascinating stuff. And and on some of the sto storytelling aspects, um, I know of at least one member company that I'd like to introduce you to, who I think will be very interested in some of your your tech. So let's let's have a let's have a chat on that. Um, right, moving swiftly on, um, and welcome also um, Arjun. Um, very pleased that you have arrived as a as our third speaker. Um, obviously, we we had to start, but uh, but yeah, good that you're here. Um, so I'd like I'd like to uh, hand over to the two professors, uh, Oliver and Blaine, um, who I think are going to do a double act. Uh, and please mind the cable again. Um, but over to you, and uh, yeah, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so that's working. Um, so I'm Oliver Pierce, um, Blaine Price. Um, I will we'll go through our little bios because it'll make sense that uh, the two of us have been working together across disciplines, very different disciplines, but actually the, the pairing works very nicely. So my background is I'm actually a consultant hip and knee surgeon. Um, you need it replacing, I replace it. You need it revising, I revise it. You break it, I fix it. That's kind of my baseline job if it relates to bones. 
Um, I've got a visiting professor's post with Blaine in computing science at the Open University. I've got a similar one in materials manufacturing and aerospace at Cranfield because I'm interested in implants and metal surfaces and tribology and wear uh, of hip replacement and knee replacement implants. Um, I've got a visiting post in Bedfordshire in health sciences where we do a lot of collaborative work as well. Um, and I was just mentioning earlier, I used to have a post at Loughborough uh, in health and exercise or sports and exercise medicine, but I just don't have enough hours in the day, so I've dropped that. Um, but I'm a clinical lecturer in musculoskeletal sciences at the University of Buckingham Medical School, where I run the orthopedic and rheumatology um, block. Um, within orthopedics, I'm the UK lead for the rapid recovery programs for how you recover after having hip and knee replacement, because it doesn't just end with the surgery, there's the rehab and then how can we monitor patients remotely and who's in trouble and who, who do I need to be warned about to intervene early. Um, and I chair a thing which I'll tell you about at the end called the BLMK Bedford Luton Milton Keynes Academic Innovations Group where we get um, uh, health care research interested parties from local universities to all meet up about once a month to try and provide a network, which I'll tell you about in a minute, um, for advancing um, projects that could lead to some place like this. Um, I'll introduce Blaine, or he'll introduce, I'll introduce myself. So uh, Blaine Price, I'm a professor of computer science at the Open University, where I've been uh, about 30 years. I came for a year in 1991. Um, I don't get around as much as Ollie, so I'm only a visiting physician at, uh, at his institution, Milton Keynes Hospital. Uh, my primary discipline in computer science is human-computer interaction, so helping people interact with computers better. And um, the sub-discipline of that that I work in is wearable and ubiquitous computing, um, mostly for health and well-being. And I did a lot of work when it was popular on quantified self, which um, Chris will tell you is just basically collecting lots of data and finding no action from it. Um, uh, I do other work in applications of machine learning to healthcare, which I'll mention a bit later in the talk and um, my main interest though is the factors that affect user engagement with the technology and the and, and the wearables to make people engage more with it and and get more benefit out of it. Thank you. We've done enough for just background a number of double acts in a number of different countries in a number of different conferences on orthopedics or I've been to computer science um, fairs and <laughs> conferences in Canada um, and it does it shouldn't work but it works very well so will you tell me at the end mm -hmm. um so we want to introduce our most mature little tangible device that we made the very first thing that when we met in 2016 2017 um blaine asked me what i was most annoyed about and what technology could solve for me and i said i wanted to know how much pain my patients had after surgery and i didn't want paper diaries and i didn't want people trying to enter data and i didn't want errors and i didn't want people making up all their pain scores after six weeks of not filling it in and then filling in all the things hoping that they would please me somehow i wanted a device that asked them prompted them uploaded it to a spreadsheet and then i had my data and so blaine said well that's an app and i said yes but i don't want an app i've got elderly patients who don't do tech and so five six seven years ago it was more true and it's less true now patients are engaging with smart devices more than they used to but I asked my patients once who had emails um, who had an email address out of all of them and 50% of them didn't have an email address so then 2017 that gave me a flavor of how much tech use there was and I wanted something simple so we made the pain pad it's a box deliberately cheap nasty droppable inherently no value none of my patients from rough areas would nick it they, there's no resale value it doesn't matter it is a box with 10 numbers on it that beeps and vibrates and makes a noise and shines a light when it wants you to enter your score from zero no pain to 10 someone's got a blowtorch to your knee um, we then wanted that data simply to go to a database, date and time stamped and linked to an identifier for the patient that wasn't traceable. So the internal hospital number that no one knows what it means is the numeric data that we get into our um, web-based secure encrypted uh, database. It's got large buttons, easy to press for elderly fingers. It fits in the hand, it's not heavy and it doesn't seem to break too often when it gets dropped in bedpans and toilets. Um, so I get out of this, what do I get? I get an auto-collated score of pain for all of my patients I've ever operated on over now a five, six year period. And the same for my um, surgical colleagues, I get their data as well. 
and we're spreading it around the hospital and so we get the pain scores of patients who come in with other painful conditions um, and we have it on the recovery ward where people go after their surgery not just orthopedic but other brands of surgery so the recovery ward get an auditable database of how much pain their patients are in daily weekly or monthly that they can then compare one month to the next where what did they do well that month compared to the month where they didn't do so well just data about which you can or can choose not to do something about it what have we done with it we're just um, submitting for publication a couple of articles where for example i wanted to know what pattern of pain did patients have after knee replacement surgery did they have lots on day one less on day two less on day three was it a straight line was it actually a sawtooth baseline did it go up again later after they went home were we not giving them enough painkillers you know the what actually happens i call it a black hole as soon as my patients leave my ward i don't know what happens to them they, they go home six weeks later they come back to the clinic and say that was tough and i say well well done how's your knee well it's fine now and that's all i know so the black hole was a, a an infant hole so we've got data of four or five years now of patients who had um, a hip or a knee replacement that can tell me how much pain relief I should give them if they went home early. How much pain will they have? How many morphine tablets would they need? Do they need three days? Don't give them too much because that's bad for you. Do we give them seven days? Do we give them 14 days? Or do we just give them enough for three breakthrough pain events in the couple of days that follow? So we've, we've got the pattern of pain. We now know as we're advancing to trying what we call day case surgery, a hip replacement or a knee replacement in the morning, go home in the afternoon. But what do you give them to take home? And so this, this paper is a sort of a background for it. Um, we've used it for, uh, there, there is evidence that if you have a tourniquet, an inflatable tourniquet during knee replacement surgery, that you get more pain after the surgery, particularly the first few days, because you have ischemia, uh, a lack of oxygen to the muscles and the tissues in your leg for a period of between one and two hours, depending on how fast or slow the surgeon is. It was said in old papers that the pain was higher after use of a tourniquet. But we use one of my side interests is analgesia and early mobilization and early recovery. We use a preemptive, a multimodal pain pathway where we don't just have painkillers, but we have nerve pain agents. We use a dose of steroids, which is anti-inflammatory and there's an inflammatory component to pain. So all of these things given early mean that you have less pain after surgery. We wanted to know, does that matter if you had a tourniquet or not had a tourniquet for your knee replacement now that we're using the clever preemptive pain pathways and sure enough the pain pad has told us from our existing database no difference tourniquets are easier for the surgeon no blood uh, faster operation uh, better cement going into the bone rather than the blood coming out everything better but was there a downside well there used to be more pain but now we've shown no pain so we'll publish uh, you'll notice the pad, <laughs> pain pad was literally a pad in your hand and then every technology thing that we've ever made afterwards we've named pad even if it doesn't relate to pad. So for example the pill pad is not a pad at all. The pill pad is another, uh, Blaine and I were on a plane to Limerick to a, um, a university meeting where we were going to talk about something interesting and my daughter had been to a party and she'd had a Pez sweet dispenser with the head at the top and the sweets come out on the top. And I was saying, moaning as usual, that whilst I get pain data now, I don't have analgesic consumption data. How much painkillers they're taking and when? And wouldn't it be great if we had a device that every time you took your painkiller, it logged a data point into my now database of how much pain they have, remotely monitoring them. And I said, but what if we made a PEZ with a button and a transmitter and it spoke to a smart device and your painkillers were in it? Wouldn't we have brilliant data? And actually the answer is yes. So we've made it. Um, and it turns out that my niche to have something that measured um, analgesic consumption has way more benefits to it than how much painkillers people who've just had a joint replacement are taking. It's much more important for things like um, taking your blood pressure medication. You don't take it, you have a stroke or a heart attack 10 years down the line. So your compliance with medicine for a medical condition to prevent complications of the condition you've got is more important than and how much painkillers you take and the market is bigger if we're talking in a business sense so if you're on cardiac medication the same is true you're more like uh, if you don't take it or you regularly forget to take it or you take it at different times during the day you're more likely to go down the line and have a heart attack if you're a diabetic and you're not taking your diabetic medication on time then your diabetic control is poor and 
you name a system within the body that isn't affected by diabetes, and I, I can't name one, so you, you're more likely to get renal failure, macular degeneration, back of the eye, poor eyesight, heart disease, blood pressure, peripheral neuropathy, your uh, hands and feet going numb, and then pressure ulcers that you didn't feel because your nerves weren't working. So if you had a way of either prompting or monitoring the compliance of taking your diabetic medication, you improve the health of the nation. Same for Parkinson's. And then there's a research use for it. So clinical trials for drugs really need the feedback data of when the patients took them to see if they got the side effects or didn't get the side effects and timing and accuracy is important to them. So that's the pill pad. No pictures. <laughs> um, we, we are working on making an interface with a smart device so that it doesn't have to have, I think, the problem that your device might have had but that you solved, transmitting over a 5G or a Wi-Fi network. Well, if it's just a short acting um, uh, electrical signal to a smart device that people do carry, then you've got yourself an efficient means that doesn't drain a battery. Um, the feedback graphs are useful to the physician. Think the GP or the diabetologist or the renal physician. Yep, thank you. I reckon we've got five minutes to go. We're good. <laughs> uh, I'll work, talk left. Um, uh, and the patient gets their own feedback. And we know full well from other feedback loops of your behavior being monitored, it changes your behavior often for the better. I'm gonna hand over to Blaine for um, some other projects that we collaborate on. Yeah, so these are, about last year, Ollie and I realized we were having uh, a lot of other interest from parts of the Open University and beyond people who were doing work that wasn't digital health care related. Uh, so we formed uh, a new lab at the Open University, a digital health lab. Uh, so I'll briefly give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of what some of our other colleagues are doing, and uh, I and Ollie tend to interact with them peripherally depending on what the project is doing. So one of the um, more mature projects uh, was a device that one of my colleagues, Simon Holland, who's a digital musician, um, found. He developed a device to train musicians by putting um, sensors on the limbs. Uh, with haptic feedback. The most popular one was to train drummers. So it would measure how your limbs are moving and then there'd be an expert drummer with the same sensors and it would basically give you haptic feedback on the limb when you were supposed to drum with that hand. So they were they could have an expert drummer in on one side, the student on the other, and it would almost like the expert was puppeting the, the, the student until they got the rhythm themselves of how to do things. So he found out that um, interesting effect of, of that is that it's a, a kind of entrainment which people do and it turns out that uh, when you have a stroke and you have a asymmetry in your body so one half of it is not uh, functioning as well as the other half you get gait asymmetry most importantly and people can't move around as much as they could and of course mobility is important so uh, Simon found that if he put a sensor on the, um, the bad limb uh, the ankle and uh, they gave a kind of a metronome signal of, of regular beat the patient could learn and be entrained to get their gait back to a normal, mostly symmetric gait. So that's one of the, the projects that also leads on to something I'm always going to talk about next. Um, we have uh, machine learning experts in our group who are finding lots of ways to apply machine learning to solve problems. One of them is um, coronary artery disease. We have a lot of data from one of our cardiologists uh, going back 20 years. Uh, which we've now digitized and uh, we have this is a person who did all of their diagnostic tests you know, they have all of their own personal records that they did so there's no variation between clinicians measuring things so for this complete set of 20 years of patients we're able to follow them up and see what happened to them did they die of coronary artery disease what did the test predict um, and machine learning is starting to tell us things that will allow us to prioritize who gets the uh, the expensive diagnostic treatment to see if they really have coronary artery disease or oh, we just got someone who's got heartburn and they've got you know chest pain that is not related to to the uh, to the arteries. Um, so we've also been working on uh, a new pain logging device related to the one Ollie was talking about for children. So we're just about to do a design workshop with children to decide how how best to uh, measure pain for them. And also they want to know not just how much pain they're in, but where the pain is. So lots of conditions, it's important to see where the pain is. So we're we're doing a workshop with that next month, and we'll have some results. Maybe we can report at the at the next meeting. Um, one of the other uh, things that has come out of the, the limb measurement uh, work is uh, one of our colleagues is very interested in helping female athletes not get injured. Uh, women have wider hips than men and Ollie could explain this better but I'll give you the bad explanation. When they land, uh, they land with their legs farther apart than men which, prompt, which can 
cause more injuries. And so it's a way of measuring their um, how they're landing and training them to land more like men so they don't hurt themselves. Um, we're looking at logging other patient outcome measures. So things like uh, people's mood. We did a study with older adults through the pandemic helping to, uh, to detect early interventions of loneliness. So you can see some screenshots there from an app that we did at the, that's a, that's a tangible device, a, a clock at the top, which is a, a, a device where you turn it to say what mood you're in and it sends a signal and logs and, and shows the pattern of the mood so relatives can intervene. And there's the apps at the bottom where they can sort of self log, you know, what did you do today? And what was your mood on a, on a sort of two dimensional mood scale? Um, but uh, the, the main work is getting the most interest right now is using uh, wearable sensors to measure things like joint angles and how the joints are moving relative to each other. And that leads on to the next project we're working on, which is Mojo. 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 Used to be the mega project, but we yeah. didn't, it was a placeholder title and Mojo, Motion of Joint Orthosis is a way better acronym, sadly. Um, so when I do a knee replacement, there are different ways of doing it. I can balance the ligaments. I can balance the ligaments by making cuts at certain angles, or I can make cuts at the angles that the x-ray makes me want to cut at and then um, release the ligaments a bit so that the tension is equal and you've got a balanced joint. I can get it balanced sideways or I can get it balanced frontways, or I can try and get a feel through the range of motion for some weird three-dimensional different positioning of things so that it is balanced in all of those ways. And the reason I'm not trying to blind you with science is to say that actually some surgeons say one way is the best, other surgeons say the other way is the best, other surgeons say the other way is the best. They've all got different titles and names for it. And into the mix has now come navigation and robotic surgery. So a robotic device that enables you to plan on a 3D scan exactly where these cuts should be made and the robot puts the cutting block in exactly the place over the knee because you've got a camera array and some fiducial sticking out of the bones so that your preoperative plan for where the cuts are can be acted upon to within a less than one degree and less than one millimeter accuracy. But we still don't know which is the best way or if they're all just as good as each other because once they've had the knee replacement done, they go forth and they drop into that big black hole of what happens after when they leave the hospital. We don't have something that measures the joint angles and the movement within the knee to the same accuracy as the robot did during surgery for a feedback loop of digital data to prove or decide which is the best way of doing the knee replacement. So we want motion sensors that give me that degree of accuracy of what's happening in the knee on stairs when sat down, standing up from a seated position, walking down a slope, walking up a slope, turning left, turning right. They're not the same. Different twists happen. So we have collaborated with Cardiff, who had taken simple IMUs, inertial motion units, measurement units, I always get that wrong, um, where they put them in seven different locations on the body, put the patient in a gate lab, a visual gate lab, using the gate lab as the gold standard for measuring motion in three dimensions from different angles, and to within 95% accuracy, these sensors that are simply on the skin, and everyone's skin is in different positions, but they can reference one from the other uh, on them, that in one plane you had 95% um, accurate data. So we thought, well, I can work with that. If I just had a elasticated bandage and two cheap Chinese inertial measurement <laughs> units, thank you, um, then I would know what's going on in the knee of my patient for the six, seven, eight, nine weeks after surgery to feed back digital data using machine learning, because the amount of data that comes out of these things is huge, to tell me and for me to tell my colleagues, they won't like it, which is the best way of doing it and that they were all wrong and I was right all along. This is the goal of Mojo for me. Um, and I wanted to make a plug for the BLMK Academic Innovations Group, which is the group of uh, universities around the patch here. So Open University, Cranfield University, Bedford and Buckingham, um, who all of us who are interested in health tech and healthcare research meet and try and forward our own goals. So to provide a network where if people came with a good idea, then we promote it and we give them the resource that they need. If they need access to a clinical trials unit, then they are part of our group. If they need access to primary care patients, we have primary care research within our group. If they need access to secondary care, meaning hospitals, then we have research interested clinicians in my group, in my hospital and the local hospitals 
who can provide patience or expertise or be, become part of the study. Um, and part of the reason for coming here is to plug my group to your group because we get so far, we publish, and then, then what do we do? You know, there's, there's this, I'm sure it's, there, there are papers on the subject, there's a gap between getting something that's mature, technical and works and actually getting it into the public domain, marketing it, manufacturing it, getting the expertise to physically make people realize that it's out there, basically entirely what your company has done for your product. We're down here and you're up here, we're, we're trying to bridge the gap. And so we're, we're, we're merging or promoting our group to your group and seeing what you got. Awesome. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mean, there's a, a number of companies in our um, in in the SDC that do exactly that and and help bring prototypes to, to market and concepts to life and all that sort of stuff. So uh, we should be well placed to uh, serve you. Um, right. So um, hopefully I'm not going to butcher this, but, but are you in Panasar? Is that yeah, right? Sorry, yes. Sure. Fantastic. Yeah. Cool. It's <laughs> it's our next uh, it's our next speaker. So um, yeah, welcome. Uh, hopefully you've recovered from your traumatic uh, journey in. Um, but um, <laughs> over to you. Please come around this way so you don't trip on the table. Thanks very much. Uh, my journey started around about 20 years ago. I was studying for an undergrad master's degree at Imperial College in London for a degree in artificial intelligence. And my grandfather was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes after a quadruple heart bypass. <laughs> this is going to make me sound ancient, but he asked me what he should eat because he'd been told to follow a, a healthy diet and exercise. And I said, I've got absolutely no idea, but this really cool website called Facebook has just started. So why don't we ask the Internet? So at that point, we actually ended up starting what back then was the world's first digital community for people with long term health conditions. And 20 years later, we, we look after around about 1.8 million people, but we've used that data in order to create digital therapeutics that essentially look after people and plug clinical inefficiencies or, or, or problems or inequities. And so the next 50 minutes or so, I'll just take you into a bit of a deep dive of what we've been doing over the last 20 years, properly for the last 10 years. So as a, we've been a limited company for, since 2012 uh, and some of the outcomes that we've collected since then. And apologies for the font. Uh, uh, this, this, I think this is part of a wide deck. Um, everyone here is totally aware that healthcare systems are struggling. COVID exasperated inequities and inequalities that already existed. But for a lot of people, they, they, it's unusual for them to, to learn that NCDs or non-communicable diseases cause almost nine in 10 deaths. Obesity is a large proportion of that. And unfortunately, the socioeconomically deprived or your ethnicity, your income and your neighborhood make the biggest difference as to whether you're going to access a particular service and receive outcomes from it. And then I think finally, healthcare systems don't want tons and tons of apps. So there's about 150,000 different health apps. I think around about 4,000 of them have been reviewed. But healthcare systems don't want an app for cardiac rehabilitation, an app for diabetes, an app for obesity, an app for pre-diabetes. There, there is so much resource required in order to enable people digitally that what we have heard at least is that people want to be able to use one, maybe a couple of apps in order to service a number of their uh, different types of patients or their particular needs. So for the last seven years or so, we've been working on an intervention called Grow Health. Grow Health is essentially what I would call a smart precision health app. And by precision, what does that mean? That means using the data that we have access to and the data that you contribute through using the platform, we essentially personalize the intervention to your, your needs. So that means if you have type two diabetes and you happen to be from a South Asian background and you speak Punjabi, you would be able to use this app in your native language with the cultural adaptations and expectations that you would expect in order to manage your type 2 diabetes. Now, 10 years ago, that would have sounded like quite a wacky concept, but what we've been able to do is by using the data of the people that we, that we service and that we collect, we've been able to work with the clinicians and the patients themselves in order to create this app that now looks after people with 15 different health conditions. At its heart, the application is this. There is a little door you can see, or what I would like to call the little phone entrance, where if you use the, the digital app, you will be able to access a world of 
data and remote monitoring and self-management and education. And you can see here that once you're using the digital platform, we're collecting a tremendous amount of data. So that could be from your NHS clinical record, it could be from your location, it could be data that you're submitting, and it could be your behaviours. You don't actually need to be using an app. So some of the stuff that I really enjoyed about the, the pill pad and, and the pain pad concept is that you, the, the novel ways of engaging people who, who can't use digital. So, you know, 65% or 60% of the over 65s don't have access to a smartphone, but they do have access to devices like yours, or they may have access to the internet in other ways. And so what we've been able what we've been doing is moving this to uh, smart speakers and devices like the Amazon Alexa and Siri so that people if they don't have access to devices and don't have which can be quite cumbersome are able to engage in other ways but still gives them access to this world of information and support where you're able to manage your health if data looks uh, positive then there's, there's often not a problem but if it's beginning to, to go in the wrong way we can escalate to coaching telehealth uh, and in some instances specialist care but no matter what condition you have, there are really four modifiable risks that you'd be looking after. The first is your mental health, the second, your sleep, the third, your activity or your, or your, or your physical activity and your nutrition. From cancer to diabetes, to obesity, to, to children's health and well-being, they are the modifiable risks that we can do something about. So what we're able to do is in the digital ecosystem, look after those aspects of health. And if data from wearables, from devices looks like like we could be in an escalating situation, we can use that data in order to plug into emergency uh, care or secondary or tertiary care. At its heart, the device or, or the app actually looks like this. And, and so you can see here, those four aspects of modifiable risk can be completely serviced in different ways. So for instance, if we start with sleep up at the top, most people complain of not getting much sleep, but if you have a particular health condition, let's, let's say type two diabetes, you're more likely to have sleep apnea. So we can support your condition with a sleep program that's personalized to you and your health and available in your language in order to help you get better sleep. And basically, you can focus on the aspect of modifiable risk you would like to focus on. So if you have a wearable or have a Fitbit and you'd like to focus on your activity, you can plug that one straight in. But what we know is that from people who are obese, and, and that's around about two thirds of people who come into our platform, they want to focus on their nutrition first because they feel most empowered to do something about the things that they're eating. We then move to other sort of aspects or features and just to touch up on, on a couple of them, uh, but go focused education. So type two diabetes, cardiac rehab, hypertension, we're able to support your health condition in order for you to better self-manage your condition. And if you require it, we can provide you with CBT or acceptance therapy coaching, uh, and then you can speak to people if, if, if required. We then move on to behavioral change activities, and I'll, and I'll touch upon that in the next slide. But all of that is powered by health, sim, and food tracking data, which we can collect from, from self-input. You can speak to, to the bot in order to input it, or, or Alexa in order, to, in order to get it into the system. But then more novel concepts like document tracking. So when you are discharged from hospital, for instance, there's a huge disconnect between the care that you receive at hospital and then what you're receiving uh, in, in sort of your day to day life. And so one of the really simple things we've been able to do uh, or enabled is just by taking a simple photo of the discharge summary, using an, uh, and digitalizing that really in order to then push it into the appropriate primary and secondary care services so that they can have access to that data. And so also that the patients know what they should be doing in this sort of bi bi-directional patient pathway that clinicians, I think, around about a decade ago were probably averse to, but but sort of with COVID, there's this there's this move towards sort of patient-centered and more value-based care, which which digital completely enables. More to my sort of nerdisms and the things that I really enjoy, we've been able to do some really cool stuff with quantifying health. And I've spent the last seven years um, working on something that we call Wellness School, which basically digitalizes all of the data that we collect from uh, you know, from, from your wearable devices, but then also from your patient record and then any of your behaviors in order to provide a, essentially a digital twin, a number between zero and 100 of what we imagine your, your health to be. Uh, we've been lucky enough to validate it, um, it with, with the, with, in Switzerland, and we've been able to demonstrate that is a really nice way of getting people to adhere to an app, uh, but more importantly, to a lifestyle in order to encourage behavior change. 
Uh, one of the gripes that I always used to have is that things like Fitbit used to collect data, but they never used to tell you what to do with that data. And so the idea here was to push people into that sort of behavioral change. And then last but not least, not forgetting that people want relationships, even if it's through digital. And so by enab we've enabled that in some novel ways, but predominantly live events or classes where you can join a health coach and you can you know join a personal activity instructor instructor and do Pilates with a group. Um, people seem to love that. Then just touching on the behavioral change, whether or, whether or not you require it on the in these four aspects of modifiable risk, there's only so many things you can really focus on. So for instance, in nutrition, um, other than actually buying the ingredients for a user, all we can do is personalize and tailor recipes in order to give them things that we think they'll enjoy. So when you come into our app, you might specify how much you spend on food. You, and we'll already know your ethnicity or your, or, and your health conditions. We might ask for your allergies. And then based on that, we'll tailor the complete recipes and meal plans that we provide you to that. Uh, and budget obviously being a huge part of, of, of what we're, of what sort of disincentivize people from healthy living. Uh, in order to make that easier, we've connected with shopping lists and Alexa in, in order to help you find cheaper alternatives or essentially find the cheapest thing that you can find it so that we can hopefully get you to adhere to this behavioral change in this particular diet. Mental well-being, uh, immersive 360 mindfulness is probably the, the part that I like the most. Uh, so in care homes, for instance, we've had loads of people putting on those cardboard goggles and sort of looking around and uh, with their iPhones or, or with iPhones that we've donated and people feel better after using those, those sort of technologies. Uh, we also provide yoga and meditations that people, and particularly the elderly, find quite enjoyable. And then moving over to activity, the concept of self-paced exercise. Uh, and, and then what people also enjoy is a key part in getting people to adhere to lifestyle and behavioral change. So we surveyed around about 10,000 people and things like cardio and high intensity exercises, they quite enjoyed, but it was the self-paced or the more softer activities like Tai Chi and Qigong that people felt more more likely to be able to take part in. But what we find is that people actually spend a lot longer in these classes, around about 98% of their time, they'll, they'll complete 98% of the exercises as with cardio, around about 20%, because I think you, you might open it up and see how, how, how much activity is involved and then switch off. Whereas with these self-paced concepts, people like sort of moving in and, and, and working with it. And then with sleep, uh, stories, meditations and relaxation sounds are novel concepts. Uh, what's cool about today is that we can push that through things like plugs that are connected to Alexa or, or smart homes that have speakers that are connected via 5G. And we don't need digital devices to be able to have access to these kinds of technologies. I will pass over the coaching and the community concept because uh, just in the interest of time, oh, Alessa, hello again. Um, but I just wanted to touch on, ooh, yeah, that's the one. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the analytics and what we do with it and how we have developed essentially the, the provider area or the provider system. So whilst all of the app that you saw was what the patient experience is, the, what we've learned is that providers have varying uh, needs and, and wants when it comes to what they want from, uh, from the data that they have access to. So I thought, quite naively about a decade ago that a, a clinician would want to see all of the data that would, that is collected and in real time. However, that itself creates other clinical risks as to what to, what to be able to do with that data and, and the responsibility if I've seen particular uh, data. Uh, and so we have learned that a bespoke provider dashboard is what is required based on the data uh, that providers would like to see and how often they would like to see it. So for obesity, that's quite simple. You uh, weight data, BMI data that, that might come in every day, might come in every week. But then there are more novel ways in order to see whether patients are adhering to particular lifestyle changes. So you'll see over there in the documents area, uh, what we're able to do is, I, I think, I'm not quite sure whether these are, you can see that, but uh, we can take photos of food, we can take photos of meals, and we can, we can connect that to the food diary and nutrition data people are inputting in order to make sure they are actually eating what they say they're eating. So some level of, of validation or some level of trust. When moving this to cardiac rehab and connecting to blood pressure devices or, or, or oximeters, for instance, this is where data can become more risky. Uh, and so where we, where we use these kinds of technologies or these analytics are more in a virtual board setting where patients may log in once, twice, three, four times a day in order to push data 
in for their clinician to see and then on, in order to act on uh, really as a point in time assessment. The whole platform <laughs> is customizable and essentially what that means is if you're a, a clinician and you don't want a patient to see something you can remove it but more importantly if you would like patients to to see particular aspects of uh, of the app or you want to encourage people uh, to, to communicate with you or to come in for an appointment you can send notifications and, and ask users uh, to come in which what we have been able to demonstrate and i'll go into the evidence works very well when used in a hybrid approach i'm really big on reducing health inequalities and so the app that we we provide is available in 19 different languages natively uh, and essentially that covers pretty much most of london uh, and a lot of socially economically deprived areas where we're able to engage with people in their language and it will be no you know it's, it's no eureka moment but if you speak to people in their language they engage with services now when we were talking about care and, and sort of precision care sort of these are the 15 health conditions that we look after and really looking at cardiometabolic and mental health conditions many health conditions that people experience are often a symptom are often a collection of symptoms and so for instance with people who may come in with type 2 diabetes uh, exhibit stress and exhibit anxiety and exhibit the depression uh, it, a lot more frequently than we would expect. These kinds of precision services mean that whilst we're looking after your type 2 diabetes, we're still able to look after your mental health and we're still able to provide you therapies uh, in order to you know, deal with some of the other problems that may come up in life without necessarily, necessarily, necessarily focusing on, on one aspect of, of you know, your health, such as your diet. Um, we've been lucky enough over the last sort of 20 years in order to uh, develop a, quite a substantial user base. Um, but most importantly, what we have seen over the last two years is a flip from providing just patient services uh, to providing patient, patient services and clinician services. So whilst uh, healthcare groups want to look after their patients, they also themselves have staff with mental health needs and, and needs when it comes to employee well-being, etc. So the app is now being used in a number of different verticals. My favorite part really is the outcome. So we've been working over the last sort of seven years or so with uh, Michigan and Warwick University in order to validate these concepts as black boxes, um, but then also the programs and the interventions in the black box itself. And I'm really pleased to sort of de demonstrate that on average, we see a 7% body weight reduction from someone who uses the app. The average app user is, is around about 59 in this cohort and 60% of people who start on a medication if they have type 2 diabetes will eliminate it, which is brilliant. If you're on insulin, it's around about 50% of people uh, manage to eliminate insulin at the end of 12, uh, 12 months, and 27% are able to achieve type 2 diabetes remission, which a decade ago wasn't considered possible, but br what's brilliant about data is that a lot of the data that's been collected here in the UK and out in the States and the studies that they've been doing with direct and unwin with low carb has demonstrated that we can put this condition into remission and there are still countries that think this is a progressive disease there's obviously a if you lose weight a lot of people feel healthy but likewise a lot of um, uh, people have a positive mental health impact from that um, and that is, is demonstrated here we see people reduce their symptoms of stress anxiety and depression quite considerably and this is just after 12 weeks of use um, but most importantly people see a reduction in their symptoms of chronic and acute pain uh, and and what when what we hypothesize is that essentially because people are losing weight joints and uh, and other areas of their bodies are feeling less pressure um, and we're, we're now working on a further study funded by innovate uk on that and then finally just what we see clinicians and and patients on the on the front line say really so we've all of this has been published in peer-reviewed evidence we see an 86 percent acceptance of referral and so basically eight in ten almost nine in ten people say that they would take the app people who don't take the app typically don't, typically don't take it because they don't use a smartphone and this is where other smart devices and, and digital sort of exclusion packs come in we see a high retention so the hardest thing that people are, experience when it comes to digital is getting people to stick with it and by speaking to people in their language and making sure we can adapt the platform to them we know that we can get people to to use the app the acceptance from ethnic minority communities is an is is an important one uh, a lot of sort of ethnic minority communities don't use apps when they're offered because they're in english by speaking to people in in the language and the way that they would expect which means that also training the clinicians 
we're able to get people to use the apps. And, and finally, just to touch on the fact that one of the biggest problems that we have is that when, because we have so many apps, how do you separate the, the good ones from the bad ones? Uh, obviously evidence is crucial, but then what, how do we differentiate the, you know, the good apps from those that are able to provide a service that is equivalent to face-to-face -to -face care and how do we merge those? We we're doing a lot of work with the, the university uh, in Coventry, looking at how we can make a hybrid service in their, in their specialist obesity clinic, basically putting their people into our app and also investigating the, the, the quality of that care. Um, I appreciate that one turned into a bit of a waffle, but it's still pending complications. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, very, uh, very, very interesting. Um, we um, we are now taking a, a short break um, of about 20 minutes, so um, everybody has the opportunity here to uh, get a tea or coffee um, and possibly some pastries as well. Um, obviously, at home, please feel free to um, utilize your own teas and coffee. Teas and coffees. Um, so we're, we'll be back here in about 20 minutes or so, um, where we continue with um, uh, an online presentation from. Uh... Thank you. Um, excellent. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'll now hand you over to um, Harry to run through his presentation. So please let's um, divert our attention to the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pim. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, apologies. I can't be there in person today. Um, but I will try my best to be just as engaging for a screen. But yeah, um, great to meet you all. Um, I'm Harry. I'm the co-founder of Space Bands. We create wearable technology to improve workplace safety. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to just cover um, how wearables have taken us through the past couple of years since the, the start of the pandemic when we launched in June 2020. Um, and just to explain a little bit about the pivot that we have upcoming. So without further ado, let's hope this works. Um, just a little bit about Ronan and I. So Ronan and I um, are the co-founders of Space Bands. As I say, we built the business in June 2020 um, in the midst of the pandemic. Some people thought we were crazy to do that, but we're still standing strong today. Ronan and I have known each other now for uh, 18 years. We've been best friends since meeting at school. Um, always knew that we wanted to go into business together. Ronan's had a series of apps that he's built in the past um which he's sold one being uh, called wake or donate which was a charity alarm so if you snooze the alarm you donated to charity he then went on to build another app which had a similar concept which was called gym or donate it used your gps uh, trackability so that if you didn't check into the gym on your um, design schedule you donate to charity and exit that as well my background is very much in sales and business development more so in the fmcg space um i ran sales for a coffee company a baby food company so yeah the transition into wearables was an interesting one but um i'll talk about that throughout this this presentation so this is a bit of a comical picture i'm sure a lot of you have seen something similar in the past but really this is the, the main photo that i saw that gave me the, the the original idea for our first product um in june 2020 it, people were coming to me friends that were uh, primary school teachers if you can cast your minds back then it was when primary school children were being sent back to school and everyone was panicking about how on earth am I going to socially distance adults let alone ch uh, primary school children and I actually saw this photo and it sparked an idea for me and I was like you know whilst it's it's comical on one one side I thought in this day and age there must be a piece of wearable tech to help indicate when people were coming into contact um and in close proximity um, so it really kind of sparked that initial uh, thought process for me, but I didn't have a clue how to create a wearable device to help with social distancing or contact tracing. So I called upon my good friend Ronan, excuse the beers here, it was many late nights of, um, of, of product development and planning. Um, as you can see here, we started it in my kitchen in, in Bristol. The photo on the left there is actually the original kind of prototype that we built on paint. As you can see, neither of us have kind of a design bone in our body. Um, but in the period of six weeks, we went from original sketches of the first device um, to actually a finished product. So we built the space band um, within that six week window. We knew that we had um, time was really of the essence. Obviously, June 2020 was very much in the midst of the pandemic. So we were really racing against time to launch this product to market. So in that six week period, we built uh, what you can see here, which is the first iteration of our social distancing and contact tracing device. Um, and we built two mobile apps within that time as well, which we launched onto iOS and Android, which was the uh, way of seeing kind of who, which employees came into contact, et cetera, um, and at which times. 
quite quickly, we got some great traction with that first device. So we were on BBC News twice. Um, we were on ITV, Apple News. As you can see on the right there, Martin Lewis was actually wearing our device. Um, it caused a lot of controversy. I won't go too much into it, but it was the only tweet he's ever actually had to delete because everyone was, you know, um, retweeting him into like far right groups. He was getting death threats, etc. I won't go too much into it, but our PR blew up overnight. Um, and quite quickly, the business um, absolutely blew up with that first device. So we sold 25,000 units in our first 12 months of that first social distancing device to over um, a thousand businesses. As you can see here, some big household names. We won some government contracts as well with the MOD and the NHS who use this device to um, not only prompt their staff whenever they came too close and in close proximity, but more importantly, that wearable device stored that contact tracing data. So the likes of an Amazon warehouse, rather than going by word of mouth or CCTV to see who'd come into contact with someone that had developed COVID-19. Um, they had this much more reliable and accurate system in place that could indicate exactly who came into contact at which time, um, meaning that they could operate more seamlessly, uh, reducing staff, unnecessary staff absence, people self-isolating and having to close business doors. So there was a real kind of return on investment there for, for companies. So that's all well and good. I won't dwell too much, as I say, on that first product. It's, it's quite depressing, actually, to focus on the, the COVID product. I, I don't like talking about it too much because it's all about what's coming next for space bands, um, which is really, really exciting. So we're moving entirely away from that um, that pandemic focus to focus on the new offering. So what is that, I hear you ask? So really, how we came up with this new device is that Ronan and I, as you probably gather, we, we, we're fairly young. So we've never worked in kind of the, our target industries in construction and manufacturing and warehouses and construction sites. We rely heavily on that rapport we have with our customer base. So we turned to them in the early days. We, we launched in June, 2020, but in September of that year, we turned to our customer base and said, look, um, they're predominantly kind of health and safety managers, heads of health and safety. And we said, look, we're creating a new device. What do you want us to see? Uh, what do you want to see us do next, basically? And we came up with this new feature set for this new device based on those conversations we had with, with our customer base. Um, but as I say, we really rely heavily on that rapport we have with our customers to understand their pain points. Without that, we wouldn't have the foggiest of kind of what to develop next. So, um, yeah, very customer led with this new product development with the new wearable device and software platform. But the issue that we're combating is workplace sickness and injury. It's a huge problem here in the UK and, and further afield, but it costs the UK economy 78 billion pounds per year for unnecessary staff absence. Um, so really there's a massive gap in the market here to create a wearable piece of technology to help combat that through unnecessary uh, injury, sickness, absence, or, or death. Um, from those conversations with our customer base, we've spent hours and hours and hours and days on end speaking to our customers to really kind of get under the skin of what the problem is here. But they've told us time and time again that tracking workplace safety is a, an arduous task to say the least. The current um, systems on the market are quite archaic. They're very expensive, very complex, and there are industrial wearables on the market. I'm sure some of you are familiar with them that tackle singular feature hazards very well. So for example, there's wearable decibel readers on the market, there's wearable lone worker alarms, there's wearable um, halves alarms on the market, for example, that monitor hand-arm vibration, but there's no one collating all of those hazards onto one device, and that's really where we saw the gap in the market. I'm just going to move myself because I'm blocking half my screen. There we go. Cool. So what does the new system look like? As I say, we're, we're just building out um, the feature set from our first device, so no longer will we have that social distancing and contact tracing, tracing focus, although the new device will have that capability but we are developing that hardware system. So the, the, the wearable device, which will come in a watch format, a hard hat format um, and a belt kit format also. And then we're also building out a software platform. So how we see the new device working is it will, as I say, it will alert, uh, it will detect an alert to several hazards at one time. I'll go into the features in the next slide of exactly how we're going to do that. But as I say, we're just building out the PCB design um, and, and increasing the amount of components in the device to detect various hazards around the workplace. So we see the new device almost acting like a black box type system. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the black box and how it helps monitor behavior for young drivers and helps to uh, reduce their insurance premiums. The way we see our new hardware working is because we're collating such a wide um, set of data for various hazards, safety hazards around the workplace, 
and storing that data, that's really where the value add comes for the new space bands device. So a health and safety manager will be able to log into our software platform um, and see all of the data that's collated on all of the wearables within their workplace and be able to make proactive decisions based on safety. So how many near misses have we had to forklifts in that day, for example? Do we need to train our staff um, you know, with how to um, reduce accidents with forklifts? Um, are we having too many staff going into certain areas where they're not certified to be in, et cetera, et cetera? So that software platform, as I say, is really the value add in our new product and that it will be that holistic management tool for all things safety within warehouses and construction sites. So just a quick look at what the new device and the hub system will work. So as I say, so we are building out the wearable device, as you can see here on the left, but the way that that data is transferred onto the software platform is through the hub system, which you can see on the right here. This will be a check-in and check-out system for employees each day, starting their shift and ending their shift. We also have these hub systems uh, positioned at um, fire safe, safety points, so fire collection points. So if there is a fire in a warehouse, everyone will go along, uh, check into the hub system, and that hub will then send an alert to the manager's phone um, on the on, on the Spacebands app to let them know exactly who's still in the in the warehouse, who hasn't checked in, rather than kind of frantically running around with the clipboard um, I'm sure we're all kind of familiar with that, um, that setup. It's quite archaic. Um, this hub system also will be the trigger for the loan worker system. So if an employee is about to perform a dangerous task alone, they'll go and click this loan worker button um, on the bottom right here of the device, of the hub system. Um, they'll have to go and perform their dangerous task. If they don't, that will set a timer then. If they don't then go to check back in on that hub system within that customized time limit, it will alert the user to say, look, you need to go and check back in. If they don't go and check back into the hub, the hub system has um, a, a SIM and Wi-Fi capability. So that will send an alert to the manager say, look, Steve hasn't returned back to work since starting to do that dangerous task. Go and check on him. It's worth mentioning at this point, um, a lot of kickback we do get with the new product and with our first product in particular is around kind of privacy and security. So Privacy is really at the forefront of product development here. So the wearable device itself doesn't have any Wi-Fi capability, doesn't have GPS trackability like some of our competitors, doesn't use AI, simply uses Bluetooth and very simple components. The reason for that is A, we want to keep price down so that it is feasible for companies of 500, 1,000 employees to roll out at scale within uh, workplaces, but also around employee um, uptake and adoption. We found that with our first device, we launched into a very competitive market in that social distancing and contact tracing space. So the likes of Samsung had a contact tracing device on the market, very sophisticated technologies came with a very sophisticated price point. But fundamentally, what we heard from our customers is that employees weren't quite ready for that, that level of sophistication in a wearable device, as you can probably gather in, in the pandemic, it was a very sensitive time. People were very worried about their data. People were worried about coming into work. So whilst we could integrate a, um, AI, GPS trackability, Wi-Fi into the devices, because, you know, being able to tell that Steve's gone out to, sorry, I don't know why I keep saying the word Steve, poor Steve, um, always target him, but, you know, if he's going out for cigarette breaks too often, or he's going to the toilet too often, you know, that just completely invades privacy of employees and fundamentally the adoption won't be there. They'll chuck it in the drawer. So whilst it would be good data product, um, privacy and security is always at the forefront of what we do. So I've touched upon the safety features of what we'll be including, but not only will we be developing safety features, but we're also building out a set of wellbeing features as well to help with that employee, employee adoption of the new device. The, the key safety features are listed here. So machine and proximity to um, uh, pedestrians. This is a huge issue in the UK at present with forklift drivers um, going like crazy, pedestrians not realizing uh, kind of when a forklift's in that vicinity. So it will alert the user and the forklift driver whenever someone's within 20 meters um, of a moving machine, um, which is crucial um, according to our customer base. We've got alone worker alarms, I've already touched upon there, but also a man down alarm. So we've got a gyroscope built into the wearable device so that if someone falls over, um and doesn't move then it will send an alert through our mesh network to users nearby to let them know that there is a man down nearby um, we're also developing this beacon that you will find on the forklifts within a warehouse but in certain restricted areas so say um uh, paul i'll pick another name now but paul goes into a certain area he's not certified to be 
in, in that area, who's not trained up to be on that certain machine. There'll be a beacon on that machine um, and Paul's device will be um, customized so that it knows that it, he shouldn't be in that area. So it will alert Paul either to put on the appropriate PPE um, to put on still could toe cap boots, a hard hat within that area. But if he's not, it's meant to be there at all. It will let him know uh, to move away to help reduce, um, yeah, unnecessary injury and also um, insurance claims for businesses. Um, it's got a decibel reader built in. So if it gets too loud, it will let them know um, to put on PPE. Uh, we've got a house alarm. So that's um, all about hand arm vibration within the workforce. Um, that's really important there. We've got that trip and fall detection. Um, as well as the social distancing alerts and then a bunch of well-being features as well um, as i say to really in encourage that employee uptake so i've touched upon it already but we're building out the mobile app that we've already built um, just to support the new feature set that we're building in this will be a, a portable tool for managers to customize certain devices around the workplace at one time but as i say the main value add um, in the new Spacebands product is this software platform that you see on the bottom left here i can't actually see it because my face is in the way but I hope you guys can see that. Um, as I say, this will be a holistic management tool for health and safety managers to go in, pull reports very easily, similar to how kind of a, um, a sales system will work. So say like pipe drive, for example, sales team are able to go in, pull reports, forecasts, et cetera. But we saw the real gap is why can't that apply to health and safety as well? Why can't we see how many accidents we're set to have next week based on historical data that we're collecting and this live data around the workplace? And it, uh, fundamentally reduces the amount of admin time for health and safety managers that they'll be able to go onto this platform see how many near misses how many hazards uh, and what what hazards are most prevalent around their workforce um, and as i say become more proactive to health and safety rather than reactive to things that have happened in the past so why will people buy our products um fundamentally it will save health and safety managers cash and time as i've already touched upon the current systems on the market are outdated they're expensive they're really bulky they're really complicated to set up um, and similar with our first device we're trying to make this new wearable as, as simple as possible to roll out at scale with no infrastructure infrastructure requirements so as I say we'll be working with construction sites we'll be working with oil rigs who don't have kind of wi-fi set up they don't have um, engineers in place to set up complicated systems so that's why we built the new device the same as our first device which you can see here um, as soon as they're turned on, they'll start alerting to those hazards within the workforce. There's no complicated setup at all. Um, creating a safer workplace, it goes without saying, but driven by a post-pandemic world, health and safety managers are now being given budgets like they've never seen before to invest in tech just like ours um, to um, improve the safety for their workface, workface, work for, workforce, excuse me. Um, but yeah, that goes without saying, but as I've said many times, they're, they're being told to be proactive and not reactive to certain situations around the workforce moving forward. So in terms of um, where we see space bands going right now, so we've um, just closed our seed investment round, which we're really proud about. Um, we've got lead investment from the Development Bank of Wales, um, who really see the value in the new product that we're building out, as well as a US VC. Um, who are focused on workforce um, and workplace tech ventures. Um, it's a really good fit for us. So we've just closed uh, the seed investment round, as I say. Um, we've also established recently a partnership with the, the world's largest insurance broker. I've, again, I've touched upon it throughout this presentation, but we really see this new device um, adding value to the insurance sector in that it will help companies so the clients to help reduce their insurance premiums as i say similar to a black box by rolling out space bands to your whole whole workforce it will give insurance companies better insight um to how the health and safety operations work within that specific workforce and be able to tailor premiums accordingly and hopefully reduce that insur insurance cost which is a huge issue for um businesses right now it's the biggest cost for manufacturing construction sectors for a business um, but as I say, it will also help insurance companies reduce their payouts because ultimately it will reduce the risk of accidents um, and payouts around the work workplace. So that's really kind of where we see this new um, device fitting in. Um, so we see the biggest ex exit opportunity within that insurance space right now. Although we can see um, this device going in other routes as we kind of develop new features um, through new product development. Um, there will be other routes for exit, but right now, as I say, we really are focusing on that insurance space and have set up a board and partnerships um, to help us get there. 
that's space bands in a, in a nutshell. I hope I haven't gone over time. I did time myself because I have a tendency to talk and talk for England. But um, yeah, I welcome any questions that you guys uh, have on the new product or anything at all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Harry. That's uh, that's great. We'll we'll do questions as part of the uh, the Q and A panel that we're about to kick off. Um, on, if I can invite all of our speakers to take place, and I've actually just noticed that we're chair short. Um, but could somebody pull up another chair, please? Sorry about that. Um, and then, um, Harry, if you could start uh, your screen share, then I'll turn the camera around so that we can um, see everybody. Here we go. Excellent. So let me turn that around so that hopefully we can see everybody. Oh, it's nice to, nice to see people. Yeah. There we go. Give us all away. Happy days. Fantastic. Um, excellent. So uh, I'd like to start by asking anybody in the room if they have any questions. We did have one or two questions over the chat, which we'll, we'll cover, and um, Lena will text me any questions that are coming in. But are there any questions in the room from everybody? Yes, please. I'm happy to kick off. Um, great set of presentations, thank you. I'm John Pudding. I work for Ultra Electronics as Head of Rapid Technology Demonstration. Um, I think you've all touched on responsibility. I think I you actually used the word. This responsibility of having this data and either choosing to act or choosing not to act, um, particularly if you've got a, an employee base, as Harry's been talking about, you know, if you deploy this technology, then you have to act. You have to use that data. Um, and yet there is a massive fear, GDPR, personal infringement. Um, I wonder what your perceptions are on the decisions to act or not act based upon this data. Is that going to limit the technology deployment? Yeah, such such good question. Um, can I kick off? Please. Cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is a question we get asked time and time again, not only from customers, but investors as well, is that, um, you know, it's, it's managing that employee and employer relationship is absolutely vital with wearable, introducing wearable tech to a workforce, I believe. So um, how the new space band system works is that by default, the, the data will be collected um, holistically and not assigned to certain individuals so that if an employer, they obviously know their workforce best, but if they know that there'll be a huge kickback if there is that personal responsibility and um, employees know that actually the, the, the employer will know that they're being exposed to certain hazards more than the next person. By default, as I say, it will be anonymized the data just to combat that kind of GDPR issue. But if the employer wants to assign each individual device to an employee, they'll be able to do that. But it's entirely their choice. The data will obviously be more beneficial to the employer if they know that certain individuals are exposed to certain hazards um, more, obviously. However, um, the data will still be useful if it's collected on a holistic level. So it's more down to that kind of employer-employee relationship, I think. So if the data says that, like, you know, 20 people in your workforce had a near miss today, you need to train the whole work workforce up. That's still beneficial, but you just won't know kind of which individuals are, are causing that issue, if that makes sense. But no, it's such a good question, I think especially with our target sectors i'm not sure about the other gen sat here but we know that you know um i don't want to stereotype people that work in kind of manufacturing production and construction but there is a lot of kickback and we're, we're used to dealing with that uh, with our social distancing device trying to implement that within the pandemic was really tough to say the least um to, to kind of monitor expectations and having that responsibility um that's a bit of waffle but i hope that kind of addresses that slightly but chris and Arjun, i'm presumably you have similar aspects yeah, I think it's a really great question um because and i'm in the fortunate position of having a, a technology product that we choose to wear and i that was a very conscious decision um there are many wearable fitness devices that are always on and so then that becomes that blend that blending of that where is the responsibility for this and for our current applications in um sport injury monitoring and um and efficiency uh the, the output and value is clear to the user because you know, it, it's 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 a you know they're choosing to partake in that um but i think it's a really interesting dynamic where the future will go between technology push and that market pull and where is the boundary of when 
com uh, uh, company can can encourage people to experience things they've never thought they could experience before. And so I think it's a really interesting kind of dynamic, thankfully, that we're in the, uh, in the position at the moment where people are always choosing. But I think fundamentally, people need to have clarity on exactly what data is being collected of them and um, to choose to partake in that at each interval. Um, and then the responsibility lies with whichever stakeholder to make a decision. It, it then it brings the owners to, to then to make that in that kind of context, I think. Um, so it's a little bit harder for me to, to answer that particular question because it's very different for um, the, other, the other guys who are monitoring without necessarily the direct consent of, uh, of, of mm. Or trying to get the whole workforce to wear these kinds of things. Yeah, and I, I should have mentioned that for Arjun and, and the two professors, it's it's kind of like a similar thing, because it's like, look, it's part of your, your treatment or it's it's part of what you need to do to, you know, address your 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 condition. So it's much more of a voluntary sign up as opposed to you work at this company, wear one of these things. Yeah, it's, 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 sorry to, to harp on, but yeah, just on that point, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's really interesting to have the... The contrast i guess and that kind of um compulsory element but for us the, the way that we're mainly combating that because we're, we're very aware that with this new device that is going to be our biggest kickback is that you know people won't trust their employer you know what exact data are you collecting on me etc cetera, etc cetera. although we do try to be really transparent about that what we collect and what we don't collect but the way that we are combating that is that we're giving employees um, their own interface for the device so that they'll be able to see exactly what data they're collecting um, and what's being shared with their employer and that transparency I think is really key um, so that look an employer can be like I can, you can see exactly what data is being collected here's your own app download it you can see all that data people love seeing that kind of step count etc but by giving them that visibility I think it helps to combat that by saying um, yeah just having that transparency there are you yeah, I, I think there's Come. a big difference between use cases and I think you can hit on that then I think from my perspective a big difference between patients and people I think when it comes to sharing data or, or using data for the benefits of health, from patients at least, they're very willing to give it up, uh, whereas clinicians don't want to see it because the obligation is then on them to then act upon it. Last year, or about 18 months ago, we did a study and we surveyed around about 5,000 people and about 65% of them said that they would be happy at sharing their health data if it would be useful, uh, but 30% of them said that this would be overall that they felt comfortable with sharing data for, for any purpose. But I think the purpose makes a big difference in, in terms of uh, wanting to share that data. Excellent. Any other questions? Well, I was going to put in with the medical... Please do, problem. please do. Yes, yeah. sorry. That there has been loop, which is what I think. And if it is harmful to the patient, I'm, I'm duty bound to do something about it. So the decision at some point in this rolling out of technology is, do I want to see this data? Um, and if I do, do I have enough hours in the day to see this thing as well? You know, if I've now got all of my colleagues' patients' data coming through to me and I spot something that means that the patient's in trouble, what do I do with this information? Uh, we've actually come to the conclusion, we use an app for the post-op rehab monitoring where there's a database of some 60,000 patients' mobility data after surgery against which their performance is compared. And if someone's in the bottom 15% for three factors, step count, gait speed, gait asymmetry. Um, if they're in the bottom 15%, it alerts the clinician. What do you do with the information? The answer is actually we ask someone to phone them because there are a multitude of reasons that someone might be walking less. It's not just because of the knee. They might have a urine infection. They might have a chest infection. They might have a relative who's ill and they're sitting with, you know, there's a ton of stuff. So actually it turns out the data doesn't tell us anything, but what we do is phone them. But yeah, if I have, can be demonstrated, if I've seen or had access to data for someone about which I should have done something, I'm in some trouble. And I think from a kind of defence and security perspective, you know, we're seeing people like the army expressing interest at using the technology to prevent injury, yeah. um, then having competing demand over. Yeah. Yeah, the firefighter who's got to go into the building but risks you know, himself going into the building there is that balance of yes, the tool can be used for yeah. and guns don't kill people weapons do yeah. 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 yeah thank you excellent thank you 
Um, we, we had a question coming in earlier, which was um, actually specifically aimed at, at Chris. Um, because obviously at the moment it's the triathlon sports, you know, running, swimming, cycling. Are there plans to move into any other sports at all? Uh, Denise from the OU asked that question. So it's a great question. Um, oh, and I've also had a request if you could all speak up a little bit so that people at home could hear. Of course, I'll, Thank I'll you. use my loud, my loud voice then. Thank Hopefully you. that's coming through for these, uh, for the, the virtual chaps. Um, are there are there plans to move outside of the of the sports um, in the short term? Um, no, we have had a lot of outreach from other sports or other activities that use um, the events that we are detecting with our motion, uh, which we are very open minded to uh, to helping to solve. As I said at the start, we believe ourselves to be an innovation company uh, as well as a but, but applying that in the field of sports to begin with as a training ground effectively for building a technology platform. Um, there are, we were talking about golf as well um, earlier about uh, helping to tell a story in activity across um, you know individual team sports uh, and, and such like. So I'd say watch this space, um, but our aim is to, you know, the swim bike run as activities underpin a lot of other different activities and sports. So we have, uh, you know, and unless anyone's got uh, any investors that they that they know that we can accelerate things, we'll be we'll be quite okay with the swim bike run markets for the moment. Um, but we have looked at other applications. We are already looking at other applications, but that's more for two to three years time. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. But yes. um, if anyone wants to come to me specifically. Very happy to have a conversation about that. Well, we, we have a number of investment firms as part of the SDC as well, so um, that, that might be worthy of a, of a conversation. Um, anybody else in the room with any particular questions? Please feel free. Anybody um, at home? I haven't received any, any text yet on that. Um, but I've got a couple of other uh, questions uh, for that. I mean, Oliver and Blaine, if I can, can come to you. Um, just as, as we asked Chris on where else he could go, do you see any applications for things like the pain pad outside of hospitals or outside of a, a clinical trial yeah, I mean, at all? In the hospital is within my sphere of influence, and that would be an easy test bed, and I can keep control of everything. But in an ideal world, a patient would simply take the pain pad home, and it would remotely upload the pain data from home to the same web database that we could see. Uh, there's a step problem there, which is that the, the patient would go home and it would have to link to something to get the information to the, the web. Uh, and essentially, that would probably mean their home router. So we did develop a thing called a Bitbox, because what we really wanted was plug and play. Literally, you give them the box, tell them to plug it into their router at home, no setup, it talks to the pain pad, and then the information goes. So that would be one way of doing it. But actually, that's all a bit, and there's a fix for this problem, and then a fix for that problem. And it's not the simplest way, and keeping it simple is the way to go. Actually, then, when the patients leave the hospital, it's an app. So having the home screen of their smart, smart device being a 10-digit numerical keypad at certain times in the day as a reminder, they click it, it goes away, then there's the reward and we get our data. So the community is definitely the next logical step, but put in the form of an app rather than a tangible device. Yeah, in fact, we have the app developed now, just waiting for connection to the hospital IT system. And we're also, the, the future there is also to collect other pronged patient recorded outcome measures um, that are relevant. So, um, you know, you heard earlier about the app where you're logging the meals and things like that. There are other things that clinicians need to know in addition to how much pain you're in. So we might have them self log their pain relief efforts before the bill pads develop that. Excellent. Um, I kind of wanted to to ask a more generic question and, and, and if we can go through, through all of you, um, including Harry. Because um, wearable technologies, it's, it, I mean, people kind of automatically go to to Fitbits and, and watches and all that sort of stuff. Uh, some might include VR sets and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, even in, in this wearable technology group, we've seen um, like where, uh, textiles, smart textiles and smart socks and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So there, there's a vast range of of of, um, of applications and, and, and potential devices. Um, but what can be done to 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 push it out more? I mean, when, when do we think that's going to be accepted? I mean, is, is it always just going to stay at the watch or when will we see an adaption of other materials and other 
devices to to make that work because i should imagine that all of you i mean obviously you've got your your de your device but i mean all of you could probably gather data in lots of different ways if they were if they were you know integrated in a shirt or in socks or or whatever it may be where do we see that that might be happening um and i, I shall we start with oliver and then work all the way down and finish with harry if that's if that's okay yeah, so what i call a wish list question mm. and a wish list of what i could gather data from what mm. in fact i almost want to rephrase the question to why not have lots of different devices that all mm. upload information to a central source? And it's actually the central source that is the benefit here. So um, medical data from a grow app, uh, a mobilization data from a smart device, a smart watch, or a LinkedIn thing. But actually the innovation being that it's all captured. Who gets to see it? And data privacy is a big question. But actually useful information to um, healthcare in general so uh, the GP, the primary, the primary care doctor, would get a huge amount of data. What would he do with it? But it would be nice to have a, a, a dashboard from your device, giving to him what bespoke even. He, want, he says what he wants his dashboard to show, and he gets useful information about his patients, who's in trouble, who's not in trouble, what do we define as in trouble. So um, device-wise, hardware, probably not the problem at the moment. There's lots of them. But the information, the internet of things, and a central resource that is trusted and has just pushed privacy to one side and it was solved by someone sometime, then actually it's all of the information from numerous different sources that I think will be useful. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think uh, the, the allusion you made to, to wearables and textiles is probably the, the next thing that we've been working on we had uh, we did did to work about five years ago with someone doing a, a, a vest with uh, temperature sensors in it that would uh, you know he took off his in Sri Lanka yeah so, yeah so that's those, those sorts of things are very cheap to do now um and so the feature detection that kind of thing so yeah I think that's going to be a good so there was patients with a garment on that measured their temperature care home not having to do the nurse going around measuring the temperature when someone got a temperature recorded early. Chemotherapy patients, when they went home, had a garment to wear. It is a theoretical use. And because they're susceptible to infection, the chemotherapy consultant would want to know if someone suddenly got a fever, phones them, intervene. <laughs> Sorry, I'm yeah. no, it's okay. Um, pondering the question. Um, I've rather, I guess, a rather controversial answer given the fact that I've spent the last six years of my life trying to encourage people to use data in, uh, in sport. But I'm taking your question more as a mass adoption mm. of integrated, very integrated electronics um, and sensing. I think that we need to make the clarity of message as to why that's important for everyday people. You know, if you look at the stats of getting people just to get up and go for a run, and an inactivity in the country is, you know, extremely high. Um, and that is a challenge in itself to encourage people to get up and move. Uh, I think when you have widespread adoption of technology like smartphones and such, it's because they combine this essential human need for connectivity. Um, started off with voice, but then was added on with the internet and such. And so you get that level of value added that can be integrated within a garment or something that makes sense to the, the majority of everyday people, I, I would see the likes of those very highly integrated, um, like specialist vests and such, um, being extremely valuable, but being extremely valuable for specific applications, rather than necessarily, you know, I'm going to put on my, t my smart t-shirt, and unless you educate the public as to why that is important for them. Yeah to you know achieve we're all um very tech driven and very you know highly functional and interested in all this cool tech and stuff but until we make that accessible and valuable to the everyday person that widespread adoption i think will be will, will be limited but yeah. no not 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 valuable but yeah. if we're talking about as prolific as the smartphone i think that that level of why and storytelling needs to come through as to why that's important yeah and 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 it's and and performance uh analytics junkies like Djokovic for instance I mean he would jump on a shirt tomorrow exactly. without a shadow of a doubt but yeah 
I don't why would everybody else technologies yeah try to do something very similar ourselves yeah, yeah, yeah. but we we recognize that even sport in itself yeah we're talking about mass health and participation yeah can be seen in some ways as a as a specialism yeah. um but i yeah I, yeah no it that makes sense it makes yeah, a lot of sense. Focusing on the reason why it would be when that's when that tipping point happens. Yeah. Is when you see that. So, uh, that yeah. Great. Interesting. Uh, are you much your what's your view? Uh, would I, you I, would I, you I, want smart on the wear or something? Would that be better? Or? I'm, <laughs> I'm not, not sure. I, I think we're more likely to see an age of genomics and precision health from the moment you're born than you are to see wearables being used in, in all these different use cases, simply because of the fact that a lot of these devices are only available to select few. There's still there's still a nurse who's only getting access to these types of devices and then use utilizing the data that comes from them. I think as you alluded to, the usefulness of them is, is really dependent on use case. Uh, so I wonder whether the, 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 that is still a little bit, I think, sort of further to come. However, I wonder whether sort of just taking the concept of, of smart technology, I think smart cars, smart homes are far more tangible than smart uh, or far more mass adoption ready than than smart garments. I, th I think sort of with the type, with the rings and the and the and the contact lenses, the wearables are quite sophisticated. We can do pretty much do anything we want. Um, it's just that they are obviously just niche products for, for niche groups of people at the moment, at least from what we see. Yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. Um, Harry, I appreciate that this gets a, an increasingly difficult question to answer, but um, over to you. No, no, I suppose it's, it's um, fairly easier for me to answer because we're in, yeah, quite a different um, situation, I guess. So, so we did. So, so when we first launched our our wearable device into workplaces, there were kind of um, there were like app based systems on the market. So, there's a lot of like app based lone worker alarms, for example, on the market. But the reason that they don't work that our customers have told us is that a a lot of these employees aren't allowed their phones on the shop floor. So um you know they can't have kind of integrations with their apps and stuff and that's why we've made our device totally autonomous that it doesn't rely on connectivity to mobile phones in pockets because you know at that point you're then relying on employees to have the app downloaded you know they need to have their phone on they need to have you know bluetooth turned on etc in terms of different wearability aspects like it is really important so we work with a lot of so we work with like pepsi for example so they're not allowed anything worn on their wrists so they have to be worn on like a pendant or a hard hat for example because they're in food and drink production you're not allowed anything on your wrist for risk of contamination um but yeah my answer to the like app-based systems for for our um for, for our um situation is that you know an example i use is that when we launched our social distancing device all the nhs business services rolled them out into all their offices and we all know how much was spent on their own contact tracing app, but it just wasn't effective because, you know, you had to rely on all your workforce to have the app turned on, et cetera, et cetera. But by, by having a piece of hardware that's always on show, it just kind of shows that collaborative element, I think, that everyone is taking part and everyone wants to, um, yeah, take the, the safety seriously within the workplace. But probably not relevant, but um, I'm good friends with uh, the founder of Millbotics that creates um, wearable um that's socks for um dementia patients so, so yeah. yeah so um and he might even be in the room i can't see anyone but well no, so we've, sorry, but... Uh, we've had a presentation from zach previously um in in one of these meetings so yeah okay wicked yeah but it, on the wearability element he created a wearable uh, wrist-worn device but you know it just caused a lot of distress with with elderly patients so he developed that smart sock to detect um kind of stress symptoms etc so now it is an important question uh, question to ask but yeah in our application i think um yeah a visible piece of hardware is important yeah excellent uh we just had a question in um online uh from tony white um what about power and charging anyone looking at self-powered devices the achilles heel is that the user forgets to charge the kit does anybody want to comment for free well, I can I can say that uh, the the Incas are, are charging solutions are trying to make it easy for people mostly to stay up to date with current wireless charging kind of methods to make that simpler. Um, not self charging uh, yet, um, due to our application is is not as as low power as perhaps some of the others that there might be. I can imagine that'd be really part of the workforce um, application that Harry you've got. Um, but uh, you know, we're not we're not looking into that at the moment. No. Yeah, we, we looked at um, we looked at wireless charging for our application, and that we just wanted it to be as simple as possible for employees to chuck the devices into like a bucket almost at the end of each shift, and then they charge. But because we rely on the 
the charging station to for the data upload onto our software platform it just wasn't effective enough to do that wirelessly so unfortunately at the stage we're kind of limited by the tech available so um, employees have to like manually plug them in to allow that effective data upload um, so yeah we, we have looked at the self kind of charging and etc but um, yeah because we rely on that for the data upload as well at that time it's just not effective enough Eric yeah. can I just ask what the battery life is on the Spaceband. Yeah, so it's 12 hours on a, on a single charge for the space band, so it does need to be charged um, overnight, and that's when the data upload takes place. And are you and Blaine, do you, how do you overcome charging stuff, uh, if yeah, at all? So, yeah, I mean, that's one of the problems, right? Yes. <laughs> at the moment, we've, uh, we, we, we've got about a, a week-long charge, so we just use a charging dock, at, and the patient's to free don't stay for more than a week so when it's taken off and it gets stuck back in the dock and by the time next patient uses it it's been charged right how do you so, achieve such a long battery life is it's, it's really low power or it's really low power chip and it's yeah. it turns on the wi-fi when it needs to transmit sure yeah yeah so there's a not that much of a drain they they upload pain data on average every two hours so it's literally it's a squirt you know you press one button and then it uploads uh time date hospital number and pain score from 0 to 10 so it's not even a lot of information so um it then in its newest form doesn't use much power listen and are you not uh, we not... normally connect the smart devices that are already plugged in so for that reason we don't have too much of a problem with that talk, uh, because it's part of the overall yeah, daily yeah. routine of we people using it it's a plug that's connected to the you know that's, yeah. always, that's already got its own charge so we don't need to worry about yeah that. Yeah, so I, I, I suppose that's kind of uh, an effective way because if if it's kind of like part of their everyday routine anyway, because they they will be charging their phone or they will be charging their their watch or whatever it is, it it kind of removes the need to think about it. Um, whereas I mean, it, potentially for your device, because if you specifically need to put it on when you go and do your exercise, presumably you also need to specifically remember to charge it so that it works when you when you exercise. I think it's a real area of innovation that mm. um, you know, battery technology powering things is a huge challenge for the for a variety of industries, but wherever technology is particularly, yeah. given the fact that we all want more information, higher data rates, and that all increases the power consumption. As an example for us, we are sending, we're, we're recording 11 channels of data on board the device and then have a, a mobile network and the GNSS um, kind of link there there's a whole variety of stuff going on within our like relatively small devices mm. and that is you know multiples many multiples of the kind of data that you would be sending over so again it depends on the application but we're looking for that because we're sending you can reduce that by doing a lot more onboard processing and and such so um again it depends on what information you want at what time frame and that can determine then the battery life mm. it gives you the accessibility but i do think there's a huge huge area of, uh, of potential there to um to grow in the future when you have um you know body worn sensors particularly skin skin based sensors that you can um, put on the adhesive yeah those small um devices can very much be powered in that way and I can't wait to see what things we come out with. Yeah. I mean, when you mentioned it in your presentation, I, I did think it could be quite an interesting challenge to make somebody do a triathlon while carrying a battery. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's a, <laughs> if you want to take it to the next level, it could be quite, could be quite fun. Um, uh, any questions in the, in the room before I hog things again? Um, I, I did kind of have another question, because especially you, Chris, mentioned this in terms of the, the, the wholesale um, adoption and, and increasing views and, and stuff. What do we think the barriers are to that? Because one of the things that I could imagine is, is a barrier is kind of like the trust. Because the moment you you plug yourself in onto to a device, again, it's the, you know, what are you measuring? Who's seeing that? How is it going to be used? How do I know it's safe? All of that sort of stuff. Do, do we think that's the main problem or, or are there other things involved with that as well? Um, let's go the other way around. So we make it slightly easier on Harry and then Oliver, you're the unlucky one this time, I suppose. Harry, do you want to kick off with that? Yeah, do you want to repeat the question? Sorry, it's like quite yeah, junky it's, there. It's about what, what, what is the biggest barriers to wholesale adoption of, of wearable devices? Um, I mean, I could imagine it's a trust thing where people are worried about what's happening with their data. But but am I right in that? Or, or is, is, you know, how much of an issue is that? Is that the biggest thing? Are there other barriers that are 
obviously. Yeah, not. So, so mainly right now for us, it's like the, the biggest barrier we hear from our customer base is all, all around cost. So for our products, you know, employers are purchasing this not just for a select number of employees, but it's you have to buy them at scale. So we're talking kind of warehouses of 500, 1,000 employees. So we work with Panasonic and Sony, uh, these kind of huge operations. And fundamentally, the, the industrial wearable space right now is it's, it's cost. So um, because they all use these sophisticated technologies that I talk about, their price points start at around £200 per unit that only tackle that those single feature hazards, um, which is just not... Um, yeah, it's very prohibitive when you want to roll out at, at scale. So what our customers told us, they said, if you can create a device that's more simple and you can achieve a lower price point, um, then, yeah, it's much easier for us to kind of get that, that wholesale um, opportunity, I guess. So for us, yeah, it is cost, but trust is a good one. But I'll save that for someone else to <laughs> to cover. Right. I, you know. <laughs> I think in order, probably cost usefulness and then trust. I think sort of if something can be useful, but if you can't afford it, then you can't use it. And if something is useful, you may forego some of your privacy woes. Facebook is a great example in order to be able to use a particular service. Uh, and then if they, and if you, if it's useful, and you'll end up trusting it or just putting up with it. Uh, but I think it's then, it's, you know, it's the kind of stories you hear about in Optus in Australia, where they hack pretty much fifty percent of the the, the 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 Optus customer user base and stuck it on the dark web. I think sort of, you know, in that order for me, I think that's really the the, the usefulness of um, or the, the expanse of, of web technology. Yeah, interesting. Chris, you are. I very much agree. I think it's all about usefulness. And if, as long as you can provide that story as to why I'm doing what I'm doing, what this values to me as an individual, I'm more willing, as you say, to give that data to somebody else that they might have their own value chain through. Um, but for that mass adoption, I actually think so much of it's been addressed by what you're currently doing, mate. It's been fantastic. In terms of, um, you know, language barriers, cultural barriers, these things are built by Western companies largely. Mm. And the, the mass aspect of it, that that needs to be made so much more accessible culturally as much as in cost. And in, you know, we, we've got a huge ability to manufacture things at low cost when people really want to. And distribution, albeit trickier with certain geopolitical aspects today is possible but the cultural side of things I think is something that um, you're going to see these developing nations very much um, needing and they're going to have completely different uh, needs and, and uses that um, the technology has been built for a for a what more of a western audience I would like um, huge generalization there but yeah I think just the stuff that you're that you're doing, precisely addressing those key barriers, that I believe are for them. For the mass because obviously, if people feel that it's not necessarily for them, why would they be activated to engage in it? There's so much that yeah. we take for granted, and in our societies, and I think that um, having that, um, you know, the, the the mass adoption, we literally think about the portion of the whole globe here. You know, there's such an amount there which is not represented, and I think having the right language and the right cultural nuances to giving that value over. Mm. I think that's one of the bigger barriers for what I'm talking about, global adoption of this kind of technology. Um, yeah. that, that's my perception. Yes, that's yeah. yeah, So for me, I'm mean, just adding to that, I think it's the adaptive use of this and adaptive engagement. Because the biggest problem is that people's needs change over time and people get bored easily. In the early days when I was doing studies on Fitbits 10 years ago, um, battery life was a problem because they had to remember to charge it. They'd leave it on the charger and then forget it was the charger. And it'd be days would go by before they were aware of any of them were again at all. And they weren't really getting useful data from it. Um, and in the further studies we did years later, we found that you know people often tried gamification as a way of engagement. And that only worked if your personality was tied to gamification was aimed at. If it was competitive, if you're competitive, you wanted to beat the other people. You may just be competitive with yourself, competing as other people may just turn you right off. And keeping the uh, the device and the the information you're feeding back to people useful for them at the time, I think is the big key because otherwise they will get bored because they're they change. Hmm. Will come back. Interesting. Oliver, anything to add? Well, not a hell of a lot. Um, but I was just in a stand out called Risk Space. Um, do I want to wear a nice watch that I like, or do I want to wear a smart device, or do I want to wear one of each? Um, and at what point, so you can see my answer, I'm wearing a nice watch, I don't want to wear a smart device on my wrist, I have one in my pocket, do I need to? Um, what threshold am I going to choose to go from something I like to something that's a bit funky looking, but has greater functionality? 
and cost and everything everyone else has said. So wearables, where do I wear it? Is perhaps the question of the clothing, very good, um, integrated. If it's an extra thing, well, if it's workspace, I really like the solution Harry had, I think, of um, things on the helmet or things on the wrist if they were allowed it, or a dock that gets all of the information. So where do you put it? And wrist space would be my answer. Excellent. Well, that's all. There's uh, variations on the on the team in terms of the answer. So it kind of sounds like mass adoption is not that easy to achieve very quickly, um, at, at, the, at the very least. Um, right. I'm I'm conscious that we've got lunch served um, and that we we've 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 come to the to the time. So uh, final call for any questions from anybody in the room. No. We're... Quick question. Yes. Just as the conversations flow. Is there a challenge around? Kind of creating communities within what to do because if you've got a community then typically they're more accountable and they're equally more engaged is that something that you all find is a challenge within itself i've got a big smile on my face <laughs> because i was about to interject at the end of that and say for mass for mass adoption it has to be integrated within community yeah. and i think just community is such a great word because why do we do what we do is to interact better with other people and other humans and to enjoy our human experience more. I know it sounds a bit, you know, um, up in the clouds, but I think it's important to recognize the reason why we have technology is to improve our human experience. And that's largely driven by community and who we spend our time with, how we connect with people and connect on um, technologies that connect people across the globe, they're effectively enhancing this sense of community. And so, um, more to an answer to that previous previous question there, but I think community is so important because it provides the reason why and also provides that sense of accountability to that um, subconscious element in your head that says, well, you know, why am I doing this? Because actually I can see other people, I can see the benefit that they're getting, or I can I can compare myself a little bit more. And I think um and it's it's a positive reinforcement in, in that way, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah. embodiment of what we're trying to do that is trying to compare people on the, on the world stage and their metrics and giving inspiration to everyday people to say, oh, I can do, you know, his heart rate is X in when he's doing his running or cycling. I'd like, oh, I'm here and this is going, I'd like to get to that point because we always want to see examples of those things that we can aspire to be. So I think it's super important and um, which has baked into a lot of the mass adoption technologies that we see today as community. So uh, it's our heart of it. You know, do it on purpose it's a way of going viral you know if you can create community and the feedback loop that makes the thing grow that's, that's the one yeah tackle them you can do it on purpose you can do it by accident or it can happen as an evolution of your device because it is useful and communities form around it or you can see it in make it but it's a it's a real tool um one guy i think you may already know about um is called professor gertz randauer in bedfordshire whose entire field and he advises the government on is minorities in healthcare and access to and everything and if you haven't already met him or he doesn't know about you it sounds like the two of you are doing the same thing from completely different angles and would have a hell of a lot to talk about awesome. yeah. excellent uh, no fantastic thank you thank you all very much for that i think we'll leave it there so we can uh, enjoy long but if we can give a traditional thanks to the foundation on the speaker thank you very much for uh contributing and um, i just want, want to wrap things up where i'm gonna share the screen um which will hopefully work um where um as i is this kind of working as i threatened earlier uh your feedback is important um so uh and it works at home as well so if you could all use your your phone just sort of scan in the um scan in the, the qr code and and answer a few simple questions it really helps us to um you know, know we're on the right track with these things and also how we can improve them. Uh, I mean, obviously in the room, it's mandatory to do that in order to get food. Um, I'm not quite sure what threat we can um, post to the people at home. Um, but um, yeah, maybe I can just kill trip you into not having access to your own lunch if you if you don't do this somehow. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, if you could please all give it a scan um, and answer a few simple questions, then um, then that would really help us. Um, so thank you very much for all of that. Um, as soon as people in the room here have done that, then obviously you're free to engage with the food. Um, until, now, until then, please fill in, the, fill in the questions. But thank you all very much. Cheers. Thanks, guys.